Hi, I'm Joe Del Santo, Professor of Astronomy at the College of DuPage, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about backyard astronomy. We've probably all been outside at night, looked up at the sky, and wondered at the marvelous view we have of the stars and constellations. What is there that we can see in our backyards? Well, when you think about the night sky, ancient peoples used to do the same thing. They would wonder at what they saw. They watched the moon going through phases. They watched the stars and form them into constellations. They even noticed several stars drifting relative to the others. These became known as planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So it's a beautiful sight that we can enjoy. But I'd like to share with you for a few minutes a little bit more about how we could understand what we see. To do that, I want to give you a framework, a little bit of context with which you can use to appreciate more of what you are seeing and, again, understand it. Now, these days, of course, there's many, many resources at our disposal in many fields, and astronomy is no different. If you go online, you'll find numerous tools. Some, for example, give you a circular view of the entire sky in which you can imagine yourself looking up the center of this circular view is the spot directly over your head. Call that the zenith. And then you'll notice around the edges of a circular view like that, you would see various directions, north, south, east, and west. You could take such a view outside with you, whether in paper or on an electronic device, hold it up above your head, and that would allow you to match what you see in the sky with what's on the device. So I encourage you to take a few minutes and look for one of those tools and get comfortable with it. There are numerous ones that are available. But now I want to establish with you a few concepts that I believe will help you again understand what you're seeing. These concepts have been with us for many centuries. People have used them to understand the sky. I want to start with something called the celestial sphere. And you'll see here that we have an image showing our Earth inside of this enormous, although fictitious, celestial sphere. Even though it's imaginary, it is a very useful device for us to use in understanding the sky. Notice how in our first diagram here, we could take the Earth's north and south poles and extend them up into space to where they would intersect this celestial sphere. And those two points would be the north and south celestial poles. We can do something similar with the Earth's equator, extend it out into space, and where it intersects this celestial sphere, we could call that the celestial equator. So these are very simple and yet useful concepts. You don't actually see them in the sky, but if you can visualize them, they will be very helpful to you. You also notice there's something called the ecliptic. Now the ecliptic is the path that the sun takes slowly, gradually, steadily, throughout the year as it appears to move around the celestial sphere. Now it's true we don't normally see stars behind our sun, it's so bright, but you can easily notice where the stars are if you were to look for the sun right at sunrise or at sunset. And ancient peoples got quite good at this. They could slowly watch as the sun appeared to move around the celestial sphere throughout the year. And this became known as the ecliptic. Now today, of course, we realize the, way, the reason that it looks like this is because it's actually us. It's the Earth moving around the sun, and it appears that that's the case. But again, still a very useful concept. We're going to find out in a few minutes that not only the sun, but the moon and the planets appear to stay very close to that ecliptic throughout the year. Let's go just a bit further and talk about two other concepts, the equinoxes and the solstices. And you can see in another diagram here, equinoxes are when the sun appears on the celestial equator as it moves along that ecliptic throughout the year. So these are two very special days. On the other hand, the solstices are when the sun appears above or below the celestial equator at its highest or lowest. We generally prefer when the sun is at its highest on the first day of summer. And there's also when the sun is at its lowest 
the first day of winter. So these points of the sun's travels throughout the year obviously mark the beginning of seasons for us. But let's take one other diagram and have a look here and visualize perhaps better what we would be seeing. Notice our observer here standing outside and notice the path of the sun at different times through the year. Let's start at the summer solstice. This is generally around June 21st. Notice, of course, the sun gets very high in the sky, as you and I are familiar with here in the Northern Hemisphere. I do also want you to notice that on this date, the sun does not rise and set exactly east and west, but rather it rises and sets north of east and west. Then it climbs to its highest point and then sets again at a very northerly position. This gives us, of course, plenty of sunshine, daylight during the summer. But throughout the course of the year, day after day after day, the sun would gradually get lower in the sky. You'll notice partway down the diagram that the sun now on the equinoxes does rise exactly east and set exactly west. We still have a fair amount of sunlight. We have some nice days throughout the spring and summer during these times. But again, throughout the year, day after day after day, the sun gradually gets lower until it reaches its lowest point in the sky, the winter solstice. This is generally about December 21st. Notice again how the sun is rising in the southeast, setting in the southwest. So do watch for this effect as the weeks and months go on. It's a very interesting thing to notice where the sun rises and sets, how high it gets in the sky, and of course, how long we have daylight. So why does it appear that during the night, the stars are all moving through the sky? Well, we generally all know the reason is because the Earth is spinning on its axis. Let's take a look at our picture here on the right-hand side of our slide. And again, you notice our celestial sphere. And if you look into the center there and see the earth, we know the earth turns from west to east, and therefore it appears that the stars rise in the east and set in the west. In our left-hand diagram, you can see what this would look like if you were to turn around and face north from the northern hemisphere. We would see the stars not moving in straight lines, but we would see them appear to circle around the North Celestial Pole. So think about what that means for a moment. We're very fortunate we have a nice bright star right near the North Celestial Pole, it's called Polaris, and that allows us over a course of hours to watch stars appear to circle around it. You see an example here of the Big Dipper. So picture again the entire sky circling around that North Celestial Pole around. Polaris, that might help you visualize why and how the stars and constellations move as they do. Speaking of constellations, let's talk about them for a moment. You probably know that a constellation is an area or region of the sky where ancient peoples looked up and essentially used their imagination to visualize various familiar objects, sometimes animals, sometimes other things they were familiar with. So you see an example of that in our right-hand view there. In the wintertime, you might step outside and identify the constellation of Orion, the well-known one. But on the left, again, you see our celestial sphere from the outside. Again, put yourself on the Earth looking up at the inside, and you can see that the celestial sphere has been completely divided into 88 constellations. Notice, too, those little yellow dots, that line there. That's indicating the position of the sun, again, throughout the year as it moves along the ecliptic. So I hope you'll enjoy looking outside and, again, perhaps using some of our tools and resources to identify constellations. I usually encourage people to maybe identify one obvious, bright, easy constellation in each season. Again, perhaps Orion in the winter, perhaps Sagittarius in the summer perhaps Leo in the spring, perhaps Pegasus in the fall, and then gradually identify additional ones. And in this way, you too can get familiar with the constellations. Well, the other very obvious thing that ancient people identified was the moon. And here you see some diagrams helping us understand 
what's the moon doing? We all know the moon goes around the earth and off in the distance is the sun in our diagram on the left. And as you look through this diagram, you'll notice again how it moves through various phases. Perhaps you've heard of new moon. This is when the moon is approximately lined up with the sun and we really don't see it. Why? Because we're looking at the side of the moon that's currently dark. But throughout the month, day after day, the moon is gradually moving around Earth. We begin to see more of the moon becoming illuminated in the western sky after sunset. And on the right-hand side of our slider, you can see some of those phases. We'll start in the top row. These are called the waxing crescent phases as the moon slowly begins to brighten night after night. After about seven nights, the moon has moved one quarter of the way around its orbit, about 90 degrees. And if you can visualize the sun setting on the horizon in the west, the moon would be 90 degrees from the sun. And we would then observe the moon to be approximately halfway illuminated. We call that a first quarter moon because, again, it's gone one quarter of the way around its orbit. Well, as the nights go on, the moon continues to appear to get farther and farther to the east of the setting sun at sunset. We see more and more of it illuminated. We call these phases the waxing gibbous phases. And again, you see those in the second and third row in our diagram. Eventually, the moon has moved one half of the way around its orbit. It is now opposite the sun, and we are treated to a view of the moon fully illuminated. As a result, we call it the full moon. The full moon rises when the sun sets, and it sets when the sun rises. So it's very enjoyable to watch the moon moving through its phases night after night, week after week, in relation to the sun, and to visualize what's going on. Now the second half of the moon's orbit is essentially the reverse. The moon has continued to move farther and farther eastward, and so we don't see it immediately at sunset. We have to wait a little while after sunset, but eventually we'll see the moon rise as a waning gibbous phase. In other words, it's beginning to get less illuminated, and it's rising later and later at night for about seven days until the moon now reaches a position where it's gone three quarters of the way around its orbit. We call that third quarter or sometimes last quarter moon. Now the moon again appears halfway illuminated. This moon you'll only see later in the evening, early in the morning hours. And eventually as the moon continues to move, it becomes less and less illuminated through the waning crescent phases until it returns to an approximate alignment with the sun at new moon. So again, I encourage you to watch the moon's phases. You can easily again find apps to tell you what the moon's phase is. Remember, the moon will not appear anywhere in the sky, but it will stay approximately near the ecliptic. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more too. Here you see a view of the sky, and I've added a very light colored line here that you can see. You notice the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, all near the ecliptic. Now this is not a coincidence. As I mentioned earlier, they will always appear near the ecliptic. What really is the reason for that and why the moon would be there as well? Well, the simple answer is that this ecliptic, as I said, is the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, it is also the plane of the planet's orbit around the sun. And it is approximately, at least, the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth. So another interesting thing to realize is that planets and the moon don't appear anywhere in the sky, they appear near that ecliptic. And you see it here again as an imaginary line. So watch for the planets as the days and weeks and months go on. I'm going to mention later on where you can see them now this summer. But because Mercury and Venus are closer to the sun than us in their orbit, they will always appear at least relatively near the sun. They cannot be seen farther away from the sun like Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, those planets are farther from the sun. And so there is times when they will appear opposite the sun. We will be in between them and the sun, and we can then see them 
much farther away than Mercury and Venus. So do watch for them. They generally are going to be brighter than most stars, and it's fascinating to watch them slowly move, just as ancient peoples did, and get an actual sense of their motion around the sun. Let's move on and talk briefly about the stars. Here you see a view of the Big Dipper. Stars obviously are of great different brightnesses. Why is that? Well, two reasons. Number one, they have what we call a vastly different luminosity. In other words, the amount of light that they put out. Some stars simply give off more light than others. As little as one one thousandth of the sun, or as much as a million times the sun. So that's a huge difference, isn't it? Secondly, I'm sure you're aware that the stars are at vastly different distances from Earth. And so just as any light appears dimmer when farther, so do the stars. Now, ancient peoples would simply look up at the stars. They didn't know their distances. They didn't know their luminosities. All they could do was assign to them an apparent brightness. And they began to call this the star's magnitude. In ancient times, the stars were divided into roughly five magnitudes from zero to five, the lower number being greater apparent brightness, though. So if you look up at the Big Dipper here, you might say, oh, maybe a few of these stars are second magnitude or third magnitude or fourth magnitude. And this just gives us a very simple way to essentially describe what we see. But again, it's very interesting to take a moment and maybe look up online the actual distance of a star and its actual luminosity. This turns the stars from small little points of light in the sky into very interesting objects that you know something about. So from time to time, take a moment. Identify a specific star. Take just a minute and look it up and learn that it may be 100 light years, 1,000 light years away from Earth. It may be equal to the sun in luminosity, or it may be much greater or less than the sun. Well, I've mentioned several times that these days, of course, we have numerous phone apps that can easily guide you in exploring the night sky. So I encourage you to do exactly that. You can step outside with your phone or tablet and hold it up to the sky and match it up to what you see. Many people find this a very useful way to learn their way around the sky, to identify the north and south celestial pole, to identify that celestial equator and ecliptic, and to be able to see the moon phases positions of the planets. So today is a great time to be able to do that with these various tools, and even the constellations will be clearly there for you to see. This can really enrich your viewing of the night sky. Well, let me give you a few highlights for July of 2020, but you can see the various phases of the moon at top, the various dates. We'll start out July with a very bright moon as it approaches full moon on the 5th, and then again, after each succeeding week, the moon will move through the phases we described. We've got some treats for you this month. Jupiter and Saturn will be spectacular. They will be grouped very close to each other, only about seven degrees apart, but there is a catch. They're relatively bright. As you can see, their magnitudes here. Jupiter is a negative magnitude, being very bright. Saturn about zero, but the only catch is that you'll probably need to stay up a little bit later into the evening to see them in the east. Mars is even a bit farther east, and you'll have to wait until even later into the evening, perhaps early morning, to see it, as it really won't rise until approximately midnight. But visualize that we, being closer to the sun, are catching up to Mars, and Mars will gradually appear to move into the evening sky as we move later into the summer and into early fall. If you're an early riser, you must take a moment to look for Venus. Venus is only dimmer than the moon and sun in the sky. It is blazing away at a very bright minus 4.5 in the east, rising about two hours before sunrise. And so just before the sky begins to brighten is a great time to look for that. You can see here a couple of views that I've added as well as what you might see if you're fortunate enough to have a small telescope. And so I hope someday you have an opportunity to do that. Perhaps join us at College of DuPage when we're able to do such a thing. I mentioned too that online not only are there various tools and apps, but often you can find websites that will provide you with these monthly sky maps. You see a few examples here for late June. 
showing what I just kind of described. If you look over there to the right, late in June, I mentioned Venus, very bright in the east before sunrise. But on the left, you see and said 30 minutes after sunset, we can see the moon as a crescent. So take the time to, again, visit these websites and perhaps others that will give you nice, easy visualizations of what you can see in the night sky. Well, I know that was a pretty quick tour of the night sky. There's so much to see. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it will help you be more familiar with it. I hope, too, that you'll be able to join me each term at the College of DuPage. I present a free lecture for the public, and those are also recorded and placed online for your uh, pleasure to, to view. This fall of 2020, I'm planning another one called Our Amazing Universe. This will deal with what we have known about the universe and how we know what it is. So the date for that will be Saturday, November 14th at 7.30. Unfortunately, it seems unlikely we'll be able to meet in person as we normally do, in which case we will have a virtual presentation. So once again, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the night sky. This is Joe Del Santo from the College of DuPage. Keep looking up. Keep looking up.